Good evening, comrades. Thank you for joining us uh, for another session in our series on Israel-Palestine. Tonight, we're taking a look at the relationship between US-led imperialism and Israel, because we thought there is a lot of confusion, perhaps, on the issue or a lot of simple, simple formulas being used. Because, you know, you look at the figures and you can understand why that comes about. Um, the US pays more to Israel than all the other countries combined. So uh, between, I've looked it up earlier, between 1946 and 2022, I before the October 7 uh, um, um, attacks, it, was, it, it spent $317 billion that's adjusted for inflation um, from the US to, to Israel. And under Barack Obama, they, he, record, he uh, negotiated a record, negotiated, he, he, had, he, he committed the U.S. to making record payments, a 10-year deal, and paid $3.8 billion a year. However, then October the 7th happened, and another $14.5 billion just in military aid in 2023. We're going to start looking at some of these issues in a bit more detail now, also historically, and then we're going to have a discussion on it. So we'd appreciate if comrades who want to get involved in discussion, click raise hand, and then we can bring you in afterwards. First, Roger Silverman, we're very pleased to have him with us, as well as Matthew Jones, of course. Roger is going to start giving a little introduction on the background to the relationship of the two countries. And then Matthew will look at the current situation and then we'll have a discussion. So thank you all for joining. And Roger first, please. Uh, right. Hi, comrades. Uh... As you say, um, I'm going to deal more with the uh, with the with the background and some general issues. I'm going to leave Matthew to do all the heavy lifting. Um, I think would say for a start, anti-Semitic myths have a history stretching back a millennium. In medieval times, the story was, for instance, that they were killing children for their blood to make bread. But the stereotypical caricature that Jews constitutes a secret conspiracy dates back to the emancipation when they were formally released from the ghetto and they were then represented by reaction either as a plutocratic cabal plotting to control the world or simultaneously conspiratorial subversives undermining the establishment and the natural order and i have to say that similar fantasies can still believe it or not be heard today one believe it or not one american Trotskyist, with whom I worked at the time, and himself uh, a Jew, shocked me at one time when he was talking about the mysterious power over the US government, the stranglehold on US policy that Jews and Israel seem to have. Now, as the title of this session implies, this is an example of the tail wagging the dog. Zionism was a handy instrument seized on by British imperialism, most notably with the Balfour Declaration of 1917. Why did Balfour promise British support for the creation of a Jewish state? It was made at a time, after all, when Zionism represented an outlandish sect within the Jewish communities, uh, especially of Eastern Europe. It was a kind of counterpart to Marcus Garvey's Back to Africa movement in the USA, or the Rastafarians in the Caribbean. The attitude in the ghettos towards the Zionists, just as it was towards the fascist Black Hundreds, was, we're going nowhere. Where we live, that's our home. So what was Balfour's motivation in breathing life into, into Zionism? The policy was announced towards the end of the First World War, when the Ottoman Empire had crumbled and Arab nationalist aspirations were growing. Zionism was cultivated as a strategic weapon just at the same time as Wahhabism was, to divide and rule in the Arab world. A Jewish homeland would serve as an outpost within the turbulent, oil-rich region to protect its control of the oil fields against the Arab Revolution and its control at that time of Egypt, the Suez Canal and the sea route to British India. In the words of the first British military governor of Jerusalem, it would be, quote, a loyal little Jewish Ulster in a sea of potentially hostile Arabism. To reverse the roles and misrepresent Balfour's policy as a takeover of Britain by the Jews, 
would be ridiculous. One might just as well argue that Irish Protestants have some kind of mysterious power over the British ruling class. For a century, it has felt compelled to appease them, although by now, they would be quite happy to cede the six counties to Ireland. In both countries and in all the territories ruled by the British Empire, a calculated policy was set in motion to promote communal conflict. And we still see the consequences in Ireland, the Indian subcontinent, in Sri Lanka, in Cyprus, in East Africa, and of course in the Middle East. The loyalists of Ulster and the Zionists were tools of the imperialists and not vice versa. Now, the Zionism, by no means equated to a love for Jews, is demonstrated by the comments of uh, one reader of Herzl's book on Zionism. I'd like to give a quote from this reader. The book interested me very much. Somehow it touched a chord in me, and I took it all in. The author, Adolf Eichmann, who continued, The Zionists wanted a territory where the Jewish people could finally settle in peace. And that was pretty much what the Nazis wanted. Of course, Eichmann went on to uh, find uh, a different uh, solution. Zionism was an acknowledgement of despair, therefore. It was a, uh, uh, a, a capitulation to anti-Semitism. It was a lasting triumph of Nazism. In that sense, the genocide in Palestine today is yet another indirect aftershock of the failure of the German Revolution of 1918 to 1923. After the Second World War, Britain and the USA supported the establishment of a Jewish state for two reasons. First, to plant a surrogate regime amid the explosive powder keg of the region. But they also had a more immediate reason, to stop the hundreds of thousands of desperate Holocaust survivors, refugees from the concentration camps, now languishing in displaced persons refugee camps from migrating en masse to Britain and America. The post-war Labour government was initially hostile to Zionism. Jewish survivors desperately seeking refuge somewhere they could begin to build a new life, free from the threat of extermination, risked their lives sailing rickety boats across the Mediterranean. And the boats of these Holocaust survivors were sunk by British warships and planes just like the refugees traveling today across the Mediterranean are being sunk in the opposite direction. When the Labour right wing accuse us of anti-Semitism, we need to remind them that it was Herbert Morrison, Mandelson's grandfather, who as Home Secretary blocked asylum to Jews fleeing Nazi genocide. And Labour's right wing Foreign Secretary, Ernest Bevin, who drowned the Holocaust survivors in search of somewhere to live. They weren't looking to displace the Palestinians, still less to create a Jewish state. These survivors were simply looking for somewhere to live. But the Zionist forces in those days who exploited these people were at war with British imperialism. They were planting bombs, they were shooting soldiers and generals, they were blowing up hotels. The USA too was initially ambivalent about the creation of Israel. The first government to recognize the new state was actually the USSR. At the time of the Suez War, the USA sharply condemned the operation in which Israel colluded with Britain and France to attack Egypt. It was as British power shrank that Israel later became politically exploited by the USA to establish a dependent client state enclave as a bulwark against the Arab Revolution. Now, it is clearer than ever that uh, whatever, well, the what, sorry, it is clearer than ever what role Israel plays in the imperialist great power game. Now, anti-Semitism had become largely dormant in Britain before the smear campaign against Corbyn and the left had already uh, breathed life back into it. It gave credibility to the old myth that there really is some secret worldwide Zionist conspiracy, that Jews somehow have a fiendish power to manipulate and control events. Many believe that Starmer and Company are paid agents of the Israeli state. Now, of course, there were Israeli agents promoting the witch hunt. That's proved by documentary evidence. But what, after all, would we expect? The Israeli state has good reason to fear the election of a British prime minister with sympathies for the Palestinian cause. 
but it's a fatal mistake to miss the real target. Let's not exonerate the real enemy. Starmer, Blair and Mandelson are first and foremost agents, not of the Israeli, but of the British state, not of the Israeli, but the British ruling class. The anti-Semitism smear was an ingenious way of turning anti-racist sympathies to the service of the racist ruling class. Having failed to brand Corbyn a traitor or a KGB agent or even a pacifist weakling, to call him a racist was a masterstroke. The initial, the, sorry, the final proof that far from offering a protection against anti-Semitism, Zionism has placed Jews in even greater danger is just look at, we could just look at it today. The horrific genocide in Gaza has given further leverage to anti-Semitism. First of all, do the Jews in Israel feel safe today? Obviously not. Why else, when there were massive protest movements against the Netanyahu government before October the 7th, has that turned now into this, um, into this apparently almost unanimous support? <coughs> and throughout the diaspora, aren't the Jews exposed now to a new wave of hatred? A new variant of anti-Semitism is now rampant. Look at these examples from comments recently on Facebook. How could I ever feel comfortable discussing anything now with a Jew? Now, would we tolerate such comments about Muslims after 9-11, for instance? That came from somebody who proclaimed himself to be a, a sympathiser of the left. Another one. Now I understand why German workers didn't protest against the Holocaust. In other words, a planting of indiscriminate racist blame for the actions of Israeli fascists today on past generations. Another one. This is the worst atrocity in human history, which um, rather is a kind of implicit apology for the Holocaust, slavery, world wars, etc., etc. Israel is acting just the same way as any settler regime. Compare the extermination of indigenous populations in North and South America, Australia, New Zealand, throughout Africa, etc. There are even learned discourses on the internet now on whether or not the Jews have any genetic origins in Palestine, as if this had any relevance whatsoever to the issue. The point is that either Israel is a creature of imperialism and its armed watchdog over the strategically vital region, either we understand that without it, US and world imperialism would be disarmed and fatally weakened. And if we don't accept that interpretation of what is going on, then we, we have nothing left but to endorse reactionary racist conspiracy theories. The idea that there's some secret magical hidden Jewish power manipulating the policies of the White House and the dominant powers belongs together with the protocols of the learned elders of Zion. Uh, Matthew will explain in further detail the real relationship of forces. Thanks, comrades. Thank you very much, Roger. I think that's really important to explain that we have seen a rise, or there, have, there has been anti-Semitism, of course, if the Jewish state, you know, in the name of Jews commits genocide, you would expect, you would expect something like that to happen for sure. Um, it was really good pointing out that, that it's mainly, well, it's really strategic reason, isn't, isn't it, why the US is supporting Israel. Uh, we're going to look at these in a bit more detail now. Matthew, please. Okay, thanks, comrades. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the thing the thing is here, obviously, is that what we're dealing with is a uh, Israel as a client state. Um, obviously, it has a a lobby in, in inside the, in, the imperialist countries. You would expect it to, you know, because obviously the the, uh, the decisions that happen in the imperialist countries, particularly obviously in Washington as the imperial hegemon affect it directly. So, I mean, you, you would expect a huge effort to, 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 to make, to see, uh, to see it represented uh, and attempt to, to represent its interests. Um, anyway, so I think the, uh, uh, one, the one question I think, uh, you know, which has come up in the Q&A already was, um, you know, why, why does Stalin support, uh, support Israel? Which undoubtedly did actually, of course, that the first delivery of weapons to Israel was not from the US, it was it was from Czechoslovakia, from the Stalinists. Uh, and this enabled, uh, you know, the, the uh, largely did a lot to enable the Nakba in 47, 48, 
Uh, and, and the answer to that, of course, is he was an anti-Semite, and anti-Semites do tend to support Zionists. Um, I think there's, I mean, the, the, the relationship really, I think, can be looked at between between Israel and um, and the U.S. in particular, and the U.S. as being an imperial hegemon um, in, in 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 terms of of, of, of of its military support, because Israel is probably the world's prime armed camp. I mean, it has been described as a, as a military with a state attached, uh, which is probably true, you know, in terms of it's, it's, it's one of the most militarized societies in the world. Um, and also, of course, this is, this is the, its prime value to, to, to the US as, 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 a, as an armed camp that, that dominates the area, that, that the US needs to, 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 to dominate and performs a, a strong point for, for the US. Now, this wasn't always the case. Okay, the US did actually recognize Israel relatively quick, quickly after it, after it proclaimed itself, but it, it, it did not have a great deal of a, of, of, of a relationship with it. It did provide a certain amount of uh, economic support on a very low level. Um, and the interesting thing, of course, is 1956, when the Israelis and, and, the, and the British and the French uh, invaded uh, Egypt and, and, uh, and so on in order to, to retake uh, the control of the Suez Canal. Um, you know, particularly, obviously, the British. Now, the thing is that the US at that point, actually, of course, uh, had made a deal with the British, uh, you know, at the end of the Second World War. Look, you know, the handover is from you as the, 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 the ex-hegemon, um, you know, the, 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 the exhausted and bankrupt state to us, the new hegemon, the guys who have, you know, half the world's productive capacity in one country, um, and, and you lot will give up your empire in an orderly fashion uh, and allow us to run the world. Uh, and of course, they, the, the Americans saw the Suez invasion as, as, as the British and French were nagging on this deal, the British in particular. And they said, basically, Eisenhower said to the British, um, you know, basically, you get out of there now or we will wreck your economy, uh, bring down the pound and so on. And the British turned around and, 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 and left. And they also, of course, the, 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 the um, Americans actually went around to the Israelis and actually walked the Israelis back to their own border and said, right, okay, you know, you, you can, you know, you lot can, can move yourselves back, you know, out of the Gaza Strip, the whole lot, and back to where you started from. And they, del they deliberately did that. So that, 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 that was quite a different circumstance. You can also see that in actually in 1963, where Kennedy was actually concerned about the US, US uh, about the, the uh, Israeli nuclear program and actually instituted uh, inspections in, in the Dimona nuclear plant to satisfy himself that, that the Israelis weren't planning any, anything particularly uh, uh, you know, against US interests with that, with that plant. And that, those continued until the late 60s. The real change uh, is in 67. The shift to, 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 the, to the position you have now is in 67, where the Israelis obviously uh, were able to win the Six Day War um, you know, against a, a, a larger Arab army or a series of Arab armies, uh, and under conditions in which the, the Arab armies were supplied by the Soviet Union. And therefore, you know, the US could quietly see so here's, here's a reliable ally, militarily uh, organized, able to beat the, 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 the local competition and able to keep down these guys. You know, I mean, despite, as, as, as Yasmin said last week, the um, relation, uh, you know, yeah, NASA in Egypt uh, protesting to the Americans that he was he was on their side, he was anti-communist and so on. He was forced to rely, you know, they wouldn't sell him weapons. He was forced to, to rely on the Soviet Union to, to purchase his weapons and so on. So it was a relationship, you know, between all these countries and, and, and Russia, basically, or, or the Soviet Union. Um, <clears throat> so in those terms, it worked. And actually what happened then, of course, was in 68, that, that, that Johnson actually decided that they were going to sell, um, you know, relatively... Um, new um, military technology to, to the Israelis and prop up the, the, Israeli, the, the, the Israeli regime uh, in those in military terms. Um, this is then actually uh, enhanced in, in, 70, in the, the 73 Yom Kippur War, um, in which the Americans staged a vast airlift, actually with the assistance of the Portuguese, because obviously the Portuguese at this point hadn't had their revolution and therefore could be a cat coup, well, they were on the point of it, but they, they, could, they, they could use the uh, uh, Portuguese airstrips in, 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 in the Azores in order to run an airlift into, uh, into um, 
uh, Israel, in which they just delivered uh, over 22,000 tons of uh, military gear uh, within a very short space of time in order to prop up the, uh, the, the Israeli military effort. And from then on, basically, you've seen this, this, this um, you know, constant um, American support to Israel. I'll just, I'll just show, let me shove something up on the screen. So you can see the, the, the uh, the, the, the prime thing, the prime thing in the relationship here, obviously, as you see, is the blue bars, which are military relations. So you can see in 74, you know, which is immediately because obviously US years are slightly staggered and the rest of it. So you can see this massive effort in 74, um, at which. Matthew, yeah. could you zoom in a little bit? It's quite small. Quite small. OK. If you do um, um, what do you call it? Slow. That's slightly better. But if you do um, slideshow. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to get them to do that. Anyway, so you can see this in 74. Um, and you can see, you know, that it's fairly constant in terms of, um, you know, is that is that that's easier to see, I hope? Now it's better. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, OK. All right, thanks. So you can see there's a fairly constant, um, it's, it, this is in 2022 dollars, so obviously it's not, it's not, you know, it's it's allowed for inflation. Uh, so you can see in 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 seventy four the 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 effort um, for the seventy three war because obviously U.S. Um, budget years are not the same as as real years. Um, but you can see a fairly steady and, and very high very high level of, of support for 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 the Israelis from from the uh, from from Americans um, with peaks obviously at, at certain at certain points and of course. Um, the enormous um, 14.3 billion effort in 2023, which is, it doesn't include the, the bill that they're currently trying to get through Congress. Uh, this just includes, because actually the Americans shipped uh, 10, by the 6th of December, they'd shipped $10,000, so 10,000 tons of, of assorted military gear, including ammunition and so on and so forth to, to the Israelis in order to, to uh, uh, supply um, much of the effort to, uh, to uh, attack Gaza. So the interesting thing really, um, you know, as I say, apart from that, uh, is the points at which there were, there were disagreements. And there's certain disagreements. And they, in actually, actually in 1982, there's an interesting disagreement over the, over the um, invasion of, of, of Lebanon, in which the, the Amer Americans were trying to negotiate a deal, uh, and the Israelis were um, attempting to continue attacking uh, Beirut, etc., uh, and particularly, obviously, the, the positions of the Syrians, the PLO in in in, in Lebanon, uh, and the, the Americans uh, in the form of uh, Ronald Reagan had uh, got really pissed off because obviously this the, the, the two were essentially crossing. I mean, you know, um, that this was causing them real issue in terms of maintaining their uh, um, prestige, etc. And he actually told them to stop. Uh, he said, "You must stop," and they did. Because obviously they're completely dependent. So he, you know, if the Americans say stop, they will stop. Um, I think there's another, there's another couple of, uh, there's a few other things in 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 these terms also that are really significant. Um, one obviously is the, the 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 assorted bits of the peace process, or you know, quoted peace process between the palace, the which is essentially the Americans then. Uh, acting to to uh, effectively take over patronage of, of Egypt in the 70s, and and uh, you know do a deal between the the, the Israelis and the Egyptians, uh, squeeze out the uh, the Soviet Union from 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 Egypt, um, you know, and make a formal peace. The uh, other one, of course, is the 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 same process in terms of after the fall of the Soviet Union, and the effort to collapse the. Uh, uh, Palestinian liberation movement in the 90s uh, with alleged peace in um, with bet between uh, the PLO and, and Israel, which essentially instituted the PLO as being a, uh, a client uh, of the Israelis, effectively pr providing the security detail for the Israelis in the, in the occupied territories, for which, of course, they are now hated. Um, so, plus, the other thing, of course, is that is is the institution in in 85 the is, uh, americans instituted a, a free trade deal uh, with israel 
Israel, of course, has a particular status in terms of its relations with, with the US. Um, the first being uh, free trade deal in 85, the second being um, the uh, institution of a, a status major non-NATO non ally, uh, which went through in, in 1989, uh, which then essentially allows uh, you know, the, the institution a very close relationship a relationship so close that, in fact, the, Israel, the, the Americans have got depots of arms in Israel itself uh, for, for their use and for the, Israel, for the use of the Israelis, should they, should they need them. Um, they, ha they also uh, have um, a, you know, very close relations in terms of the, the actions of their military, which I'll go, I'll go into a, a, a little more in a minute. Um, the... In terms of what what's uh, then happened, uh, subsequent development in, in 2008, which is significant, uh, was the uh, the move to uh, for the, the U.S. Congress, uh, you know, the whole passed an act, which included um, a, 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 the, the notion that that, that uh, um, Israel should be able to maintain a, a, quali a quant qualitative military advantage over all of its neighbors put together um which is is, is, is formally in in u.s law so that the americans will provide enough arms uh, that 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 continues um so in those terms it's it it, it really is quite a, a you know a lock uh in terms of dominating an entire area uh it also means of course at the same time that the Amer the israelis are, are are dependent on 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 the Americans um, that you know they need to to agree with the Americans their, their military um, operations uh, and in fact if you look at the latest um, uh, operation in Gaza the the attack on Gaza um, on October the eighth if you go into the log of the uh, of the White House uh, it actually notes that um, Biden and there was a telephone call between Biden and Netanyahu. In which Biden basically says, "Well, you do, you go ahead and do what you want. Uh, we'll supply the weapons." Um, and not only that, just because because he was he was a generous man and obviously a, a basically genocide Joe, uh, Biden also supplied the Israelis with a three-star Marine Corps general um, to assist in the planning of the assault on Gaza. So the assault on Gaza is actually the responsibility of the U.S. government as much as it is uh, of the uh, the Israeli government. So you can see how closely they are they are integrated together. Um, I'll go through there's a couple of other slides. So you can see here this is this is imports of, of arms from uh, fr from from the United States to Israel, and Israel is is totally dependent on that relationship from the from the U.S. as as imperial hegemon. Um, and as I say, it means that. The, the Israeli military is, is effectively integrated uh, and has to has to obey American American commands, not the other way around. Uh, this this quote, which I, is is brilliant, um, Joe Biden, of course, is one of the world's great Zionists, um, and he he said this. He's been in, obviously he was in the Senate from from the early seventies, and he's said this on multiple occasions going back decades. This is a quote from the 15th, from the, the uh, celebration of the independence of Israel um, uh, in April uh, 2015, which he's basically saying, well, you know, if we didn't have, if we didn't have Israel, we'd have to invent it because it does it, it, it does the job that we need to. Um, but obviously, there is a, a there are differences between the two. I mean, you know, you you can look at it really. I mean, the way I look at it is it, it, Israel's like a dog on a leash. I mean, obviously, the dog has its own interests. It doesn't do what, exactly what it's told, but it has a, it knows it knows which other where the other end of the dog of the leash is. Um, you know, which it quite, quite clearly is in 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 Washington. Finally, uh, it's also this is also useful in terms of looking at um, uh, uh, the, the trade of Israel. If you want to if you want to look at that and, and say I think it's secondary to the military. Um, relationship, um, principally the export is to the United States because obviously of the free trade agreement, which allows the, the Israeli economy to, to, to operate in those terms. It's something the US has done with a number of other countries. South Korea comes to mind, there's a few others. 
Um, and you can then also see the relationship with the, the European country, countries as being important in there as well. But the US is the largest single operator in those terms. Um, so in those, it, you know, as I say, I think that to sum up that, that what we're looking at is a relation between uh, the imperial hegemon, uh, but, but one that is declining and degen in, in the case of degeneration, uh, one that has shifted to, to war. I mean, you know, if you look at it, I mean, you know, once you once the, once the Soviet Union is, is is dissolved, then the U.S. basically, you know, goes to full on. Um, we will continue to have wars all the time in 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 various parts of the world, um, and you know, in an effort to maintain its own power. Um, some many times, uh, these wars, of course, backfire. I mean, we've seen, you know, the disaster in Iraq. Um, which is I mean, disastrous, first of all, for people in Iraq, but also for, for US imperialism. We've seen a disaster in, in, in Afghanistan, the same, same applies. We've seen a disaster in Ukraine, you know, in which clearly, you know, Biden is, 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 is incapable of, of, of producing anything out of that, other than obviously a lot of dead people. And we're now seeing a disaster in, 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 in Israel, because obviously we're seeing, as people have said, um, you know, really the, the end point we're starting to see the end point of the whole Zionist project. But the question really then is how much blood is involved and the, the, the fact that it's the, the poor Palestinians who are really suffering the, the, the consequences of, of the, the, this uh, decline and fall. Thanks. Thank you very much, Matthew. Thank you, uh, Roger. I think before we open up for um, comments and contributions from the floor, um, I have a little discussion with you quickly and Let's try um, to bring it to a point that I think Matthew, you you made did a good job there. You know, saying that um, you think it's Israel is the dog on the leash, and I and I see it more that way around as well. I can see from the chat though <laughs> that there's a bit of a difference of opinion with with other comrades there. So let's see. I mean, like looking looking back now, let's concretely the the relationship of U U.S. and Israel. I mean, it's. It's and we had this discussion last week, looking at Nasser and the Arab Revolution, and it was quite clear. And Yasmin explained what the reason was there for the U.S. to support Israel as a, as a bulwark against those Arab revolutions, etc. Et and you know, propping up financially one, you know, theocratic leader against another, and then you have uh, all kinds of all kinds of. Um, unintended consequences of organizations uh, developing that uh, supported with US money um, that then didn't actually quite do what what you wanted them to do. So and you know the how the power shifted after World War II and it's been moved on from from the US uh, from from Britain and France to the US. I think that that was uh, all very, very clear. Today then looking at today, I mean like you know, it's quite easy to see why Israel needs the U.S. Um, you know, it's a mutual relationship for sure, but the, US, the Israel needs the U.S. in order to continue its campaign um, of genocide against the Palestinians. Clearly, if if the U.S. wasn't there to protect Israel, it would have a very hard time uh, continuing this campaign and would be probably under sanction uh, when it comes to U.N., etc., which the U.N. has tried uh, before and nothing come of it. But then today, um, you know, what's what's in it for the U.S. really? Is it oil? Is it? I mean, you mentioned war. Is it other strategic interests? First, first to you, Roger, and then and then uh, Matthew. In a few in a few sentences, if you can, um, what's in it for for both sides? What do you think? Um, I'm not sure if I can add anything to what I said. The um... What, what's in it for both sides? Israel, of course, uh, needs the protection of Israel. Uh, sorry, yes, it needs the protection of the USA. Um, it needs the armaments. It needs the financial aid. It, it couldn't survive uh, w without them. The USA needs Israel because um, they have to protect their interests in, the, in this vitally important strategic um, economically strategic uh, area of the world, the control of the oil fields, etc., uh, and as a hedge against the um, the the revolution, which is I mean all of the countries around around Israel are bubbling 
with uh, with civil war, with discontent, with um, uh, potential uprisings or actual uprisings, and so on. And um, uh, you know, Israel is is um, a godsend to them as a sort of area, or has been as an area of stability. Of course, that stability is getting completely wrecked now. I don't think we couldn't rule out the possibility that at some stage in the future. Uh, America could um, shift its um, base in the Middle East. There's no, there's no, I mean, this, the, the idea that there's, uh, I mean, it's all very well for people in the chat to say, um, uh, you know, of course there are conspiracies. Of course there are conspiracies. There are lots of conspiracies. What we talk about is whether this one can be ascribed to some kind of conspiracy by the Jews to uh, to somehow control the most, the most powerful uh, economy and political state on earth. And um, I just think it's obvious if we're a Marxist, we have to understand uh, that, that, that people have material uh, motives and material interests. So I'll leave it at that. Mm, thanks. Matthew? Yeah, I think the thing is that, that, that clearly in, in, in geostrategic terms, I mean, obviously the Middle East is important. I mean, you know, um, in terms of both the supply of oil, but also in, 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 in global terms. I mean, the US, as, as, as hegemon, wishes to ma maintain its dominance of the world, uh, and the, the Middle East is central. So, I mean, the, the, the thing is, obviously, having a, your own uh, armed camp in the middle of it, um, you know, it, it is, is strategically extremely important. And, I mean, obviously, the, the thing is, if you look at it, the US, of course, is, is, has fomented a war with, with Russia, um, and, and and seeks to 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 destroy Russia, uh, and is and and is working to a war, towards a war with China, you know. Uh, essentially, you know, we're seeing if if it's not stopped, I mean, the process towards a world that's World War Three. So that's what it is, and you can see. I mean, the the the, the whole thing is uh, it requires um, an anchor in those terms. So that the 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 Israelis are very useful in those in those terms. I mean, the thing is, obviously, from the Israelis' point, point of view, they wouldn't survive without the US uh, and uh, and other imperialist patronage. But I mean, the thing is, uh, the other imperialist powers are important, but they are second line. They're, you know, they're they're, they're subordinate to to the US. Mm. Uh, and that's an interesting um, subject that, that Roger mentioned. There is um, nothing lasts forever. I mean, you could see that the US. With a change, change of president or not, you know, could just say, well, maybe Saudi Arabia is now stable enough, or we have a hold on on that, and we don't need Israel anymore. Can you can you see um, Israel with uh, sort of US withdrawing funding? It's been remarkably, of thing is, it's been remarkably consistent. Actually, I mean, the thing is, bits and pieces. If you look at the thing about American foreign foreign policy when it comes to these sort of things like this, is it, it it is remarkably consistent. I mean, whatever they. Yeah, there's sort of words and so on and so forth, but they 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 carry on the same line. You know, really. I mean, there's bits and pieces around the edges, but the the line is is the same. You know, you can see con quite clear continuity between Trump and Biden, for instance, and what they've done, um, and then going back, uh, you know, into into Obama and 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 uh, Bush Jr. and so on and so forth. There's never, you know, and and and, and it, it, it it's not the case of, you know. I mean, you can look at it and say, well, personally, of course, there is a, and it's known that Netanyahu and Biden can't abide each other. They can't stand each other. They hate each other, really. But the point is that the, in material terms, they, they have to stick together. It's business. It's, it's mm. imperialism. Mm. So, Roger, you you don't see a, a, an ending of um, support anytime soon, and with the with the you know I, the possibility of a World War Three, which I agree we're, we're much closer now than we we've ever been before, um, that this relationship is lasting a little while longer. If you're asking me to predict now, I would never have uh, predicted the um, the 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 holocaust the genocide of gaza it came completely out of the blue i know we're not supposed to, we're supposed to be um clairvoyant marxists and to understand and to predict but all we can say is it's such a completely uh explosive unstable uh situation uh in in the middle east especially but in the world as a whole that nothing can be ruled out. So I'm sorry that's not a very uh, uh, particularly useful answer, but I think that's the most honest answer I can give. Yeah. 
Okay, I'm going to bring in uh, Tony now, um, who's said in the chat that he disagrees with a few things, but also might might ask some questions or open up some new areas of discussion. Yeah, uh, thank you, Tina. Uh, can everyone see me? Yeah. Uh, there you are. Certainly, the United States sees Israel as a stable settler base, and quite rightly so. And I think what uh, Reagan's Secretary of State, uh, whose name escapes me for the moment. Baker, was it? Uh, who? Baker. No, no, that wasn't Jim. Sure. Baker. Alex Haig. Uh, Haig, 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 Haig. Yeah, well, he, well, he said actually support for Israel, which was about $4 billion a year, I think then, uh, was cheap at the price. Uh, it was an unsinkable aircraft carrier, uh, and there wasn't even one American soldier involved in this fighting. And I, I think that is true, because I, I, I used to ask myself, is there anything Israel can do which the United States would disapprove of and hold its aid to? And uh, the answer in Gaza is no, there is actually nothing that Israel can do which the United States won't go along with. With all the caveats, with all the kind of uh, mopping of the brow and, uh, you know, the plaintive wringing of the hands of Blinken, the fact is they're still supplying them with the weapons. And when it came to the international court hearing, what did America say? It was meritless South Africa's case without foundation, uh, not based on fact. And yet, of course, we saw through the brilliant exposition of the Irish KC, that it, it was anything but that. Uh, it was methodical, uh, and the court accepted there was a plausible genocide. But I, I do disagree with Roger uh, in his whole analysis of the post-45 uh, situation. And really, we need to go back. Zionism was a movement that was created. It was an independent movement. It was the most reactionary section of the Jewish uh, population. Uh, originally, Zionism was a Christian evangelical idea. It wasn't a Jewish idea at all. Uh, and, and from the start, from Herzl, they sought an imperialist patron. And in 1917, they got one. I mean, it had been intimations earlier. Uh, but it, it, the Balfour Declaration, uh, Balfour himself was a, a, a dedicated anti semite there was an alliance between British imperialism and Zionism. And without British imperialism, Zionism would never have got a foothold. It simply wasn't strong enough and it would have been driven out. However, during the war, when Zionism did attain a center of gravity, uh, uh, if you like, a mass, uh, a vital uh, ma mass of population, uh, thanks to Hitler, and when I said uh, at a, a seminar, the Palestine Expo, uh, about four years ago that Israel was Hitler's bastard offspring, uh, the Jewish Chronicle went to town and threw up its hands in horror. But it's actually true. Uh, without Adolf Hitler, uh, it's questionable to say the least whether the Israeli state would have had the critical mass in order to establish itself. But during the war, the Zionist movement, which is politically very adept, it shouldn't be underestimated, it had an internal debate, in essence, about switching imperialist partners between the United States and Britain, because it was quite clear the United States was on the up and Britain was on the down. Uh, and that was epitomized in two figures in the Zionist movement, Chaim Weizmann, the first president of Israel, and then the president of the Zionist organization, who was pro-British, and David Ben-Gurion, who was the chair of the Jewish agency and Israel's first prime minister, who was pro-Israel. And that is the context in which the Zionist militias after 1945, and even before 1945, in terms of the Egan and Lehi, attacked the British forces. But they didn't do so as anti-imperialists. They, they were thoroughly, mm -hmm. thoroughly pro-imperialist in the same way as when the Boers went to war with the British in South Africa. They didn't do it from an anti-racist or anti-imperialist perspective. It was, if you like, uh, it was a fighting out uh, amongst uh, the thieves. Uh, the thieves had fallen out, uh, and, and the same was true in Palestine. But it's not true that the, Isra the British government under Bevin uh, was anti-Zionist. It wasn't anti-Zionist. I mean, it still supported the Zionists in, in Palestine. 
it held back the Palestinian resistance and indeed fate in many ways fatally undermined it and it held back its own army in, in Jordan, which Glen Pasha, which was under the control of Britain, uh, and conspired in many ways to weaken the Palestinians, even though it was being fought. And uh, senior figures in the Labour Party at that time actually supported the Zionist attacks on the British troops. Richard Crossman, for one, uh, who later became uh, a cabinet minister under Harold Wilson. So it, it's not true. Ro Roger talks about the boats which were sunk. I'm not aware that the British sunk any boats of any Holocaust survivors, and I'll be interested for the names of that those boats. The only operation was Operation Embarrass, which was a secret MI6 operation, which was about disabling the boats and planting a bomb on one of them in Italian ports. The only sinking in refugee ships was one, the Struman, I think 1943, when 800 uh, survivors, Holocaust survivors, lost their lives and what, only one survived. We don't know what happened with that. It is a complete mystery. The other one was the Patria in the harbour of Haifa, and that was sunk by Haganah. And Haganah sunk it because they preferred the Holocaust survivors to die and therefore to make the symbolic protest than for them to be shipped to Mauritius. I mean, that is the reality. The British stopped the boat. The British boarded the boat. The British tried to deport them to Cyprus, Mauritius and other places. I'm not aware that they sank. But the, the real situation is this. That in during the Second World War, the Zionists were vehement in opposing any refugee, any rescue scheme for Jewish refugees that whose destination was not Palestine, because in their view, the only task at hand was building a Jewish state, and to save Jews from any other place would render the Jewish state worthless. There would be no point in it. And so, when Herbert Morrison in 1942 turned down the application of thousands of Jews, 2,000 plus Jews who were in uh, Vichy, France, uh, the Vettel detainees who were on the brink of being deported to Auschwitz, the Zionists did not oppose that. They supported Morrison throughout. They had no problem with Holocaust refugees uh, not surviving. They only used them as a battering ram to get into Palestine. And we know in the displaced persons camp that the Haganah, viciously attacked the Bundist survivors of the Holocaust because the Bundist did not want to go to Palestine either. And that is admitted. There's no doubt about that whatsoever. So, I mean, we, we need to look at the Zionist role. They suppressed the desire of most of the Holocaust survivors in a displaced persons camp to go to the USA and Britain. And in America, the Zionists opposed lowering the immigration barriers. They were quite key in that campaign. They aided, if you like, those, the anti-Semites who opposed Jews coming in. And, uh, and not to mention that, I, I, I think is quite remarkable. Uh, as regards the genetic association and the new variant of anti-Semitism, I don't accept this at all. Racism without state power is really just a prejudice. And of course, there are some people in the Palestine Solidarity Movement, very few incidentally, uh, who look at it as the Jews. The real problem, is that the British bourgeoisie, and not just the British, the Americans as well, are adopting Jews as almost their colonial pets uh, in terms of anti-Semitism. So only today we hear of a five and a half million pound programme in the schools in Britain to uh, fight anti-Semitism. Of course, the anti-Semitism of the IHRA, not genuine anti-Semitism. It's this adoption of Jews by the various bourgeois states, Germany, Britain, the United States, and so on, as a pretext, a moral pretext for their support for Israel, which I think should be worrying. The actual incidence of anti-Semitism is remarkably low, considering that Israel does everything it does in the name of the Jews. Uh, what, what else? This genetic association, well, the whole claim of Zionism to, to a Jewish state is that Jews are returning, that they are genetically associated. It's not surprising that people sometimes come up with evidence which suggests that this is not true. I, I don't think this is particularly anti-Semitic. It's, if anything, a reaction to the anti-Semitism of the Zionist movement. I, I think that's important to uh, mention. Uh, as regards uh, the Suez, 
because of course there was after the war there was a continual tussle between britain and america britain didn't just give way it fought every inch of the way to retain its foothold in the middle east and that's why stalin so stupidly backed uh, the zionists he thought that was the way to get the british out but the british were going anyway because the united states wanted them out because it wanted to be the economic superpower in the middle east and Suez was the culmination of that and of course as matthew said when britain and france conducted their agreement the secret agreement uh, together with uh, the french at Sevres. Uh, the United States stepped in and instituted a run on the pound and Britain very quickly got the message that it wouldn't economically survive. And that was then the beginning of the so-called independent nuclear deterrent Polaris with the Americans. Of course, it's not independent either, but that really is the context. Uh, and all this stuff about Holocaust survivors going to Palestine. Well, they were, going, they were going as settlers, that is a fact. And one third of those who fought in the 1948 war were Holocaust survivors. And by all accounts, they were the worst, which just goes to show that victims can sometimes become perpetrators as well. But uh, I, I say the main lesson to be drawn is uh, that uh, Israel is supported by the United States, not for love of Jews, but for love of its own interests. Whether it will ever dissociate I somehow doubt it's not impossible. It, it, it is possible that it will dissociate, but it will take revolution in the Arab East, I think, to dislodge it from that position, by which time it will be immaterial anyway. But for the moment, uh, the United States has made it very, very clear where it stands. Thank you. Thanks, Tony. Just the last question quickly. Do you, do you agree with um, how Matthew put it, that it's sort of Israel is the dog, if you want that kind of analysis? analogy um well yes it's a racist rottweiler isn't it yeah uh yes i mean it, it, israel likes to portray itself as a mad dog because it thinks then the uh, palestinians and the lebanese won't will think it's irrational and therefore they won't provoke it i mean it deliberately cultivates that image yes a big group of you uh, could stay with us if yeah, you want sure. tony because yeah, there yeah, might yeah. be disagreements coming yeah. along um roger do you want to reply to some of what tony was saying just now uh, yes, yeah, so most of what Tony says, I actually agree with. I think he maybe I've expressed it badly, and maybe um, maybe he misunderstood what I was saying. First of all, of course, I never said that the Zionists were ever anti-imperialist. Uh, I simply uh, drew attention to the fact that the Zionists, uh, the uh, the Zionist uh, militias, were fighting against uh, British imperialism, fighting against the. Um, the occupation by Britain um, in the in their interests. Of course, they're not anti anti imperialist. Um, as for the um, the question of the boats, well, it was my information that I read it, and I'll check my sources. But I do uh, obviously I know that Tony is an expert on the issue, and I may be mistaken on that. But nevertheless, it is it surely is not um, wrong to uh, point out. That until until the establishment of Israel in 1948, that the British Labour government was preventing the uh, emigration of uh, Jews and largely of Holocaust survivors um, to to Israel, and that's uh, I don't think um, I'm surprised if you like that he's um, uh, questioned that. On the other the other questions, um, well, he says it's not surprising that there are these. Uh, questions are raised about uh, genetics and so on. Of course, it's not surprising. It's not surprising that uh, with the horrors of the genocide in um, in Gaza, it's not surprising that it has given rise to and uh, given some kind of uh, substance to anti-Semitic feelings. I'm not saying that it that it's uh, a major threat, but I think it's something to watch and something to, to speak out against. We have to call out when people say things like, how can I ever talk to a Jew again? People who claim to be socialists, then I think we have to call it out. So we have to say uh, that that's um, absolutely, um, you know, it, it, we, it's completely wrong. It's completely out, outrageous to, to to blame that, to talk about um, now I know why the, um, why the German workers were not opposed to the Holocaust. I mean, that is an outrageous uh, comment. Um, I'm not saying that it's, that there's, uh, that it's very widespread. I'm saying that where we see signs of it, we need to snap it out. Um, maybe I'll come back later if there's other mm. things raised. Yeah. 
Um, because I don't think uh, I want to bring in Ian Donovan because he does have a, a different view, and it'd be good to hear uh, somebody who doesn't agree with the analysis we've just heard. I trust yeah. that's where you're coming from. <laughs> <laughs> Hang on one second. Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, yeah, I'm not going to speak for too long because I've got a few notes and things. I've put quite a lot of what I have to say in the chat. But uh, I do think this is a mechanical view uh, of, of what's going on. And I think, uh, you know, it's very, very, there's, there's a very, very common left view that simply portrays Israel as a, as a lackey of US imperialism. And, and before that, a lackey of British imperialism, you know. But it didn't actually behave like that when uh, at certain crucial junctures in history. I mean, the obvious example is the King David Hotel, which was a huge military blow against Britain, which basically forced the British to evacuate in, in a couple of years, you know, um, from, from, from its, its role in, as overseer of, the, uh, of, of the, the Palestine mandate. It basically skedaddled after that, and the Zionists had effectively kicked them out. You know, likewise, when the Americans intervened, they were sort of buzzing around the edges of, 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 and, and, and getting in the way at the, at the time of the Six Day War or just afterwards. They sank the uh, USS Liberty. Uh, and, and basically, the, the Americans have had to eat it. And anybody who raises this in America gets accused of anti Semitism, whether they're coming from a nationalist standpoint or from any other sort of uh, criticism of it, you know. And I think it's wrong to talk about every, anybody who thinks that who raises questions about the, the role of Zionism in the world is anti-Semitic or is uh, uh, is uh, uh, echoing the protocols of the elders of Zion or something. First of all, the Nazis actually caricatured things that were, at least in embryonic form, real, and we're now seeing that 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 uh, that, that you know I think I think Zionism was seen as a potential rival in some ways, and that's explained some of the elements of what of what became the genocide. But I also think that um, you, you know you, you, you know what what people said about stores you know stores remark famous remarks about uh, israel will be a loyal little jewish holster it's not loyal it was never loyal it's loyal to itself and uh, uh, um, joe biden says that israel, if israel was an aircraft if it, israel is an aircraft carrier and if it, it didn't exist they'd have to invent it but really would they have to invent it it doesn't make much sense because you know, if you look at the relationship of, of the United States with the Arab and Muslim world today, it's never been worse, right? They are facing millions of strong anti-American demonstrations as far away as Indonesia, you know, an incredible hostility right across the, the, the Arab world, the Muslim world, from from Morocco to, to, to well, to, to Indonesia. You know, it's a huge area of the world, hugely strategically important. And they're blowing it. They're driving people into the arms of the Russians in their terms and geopolitical rivals. BRICS is growing and it's recruited Egypt. It's recruited Saudi Arabia. It's recruited the UAE. And it will probably recruit Indonesia. You know, this is not in the interest of US imperialism. It sees China and Russia as its main strategic enemies, not really the, uh, the Arab states who face Israel. And it doesn't make sense from a world strategic aspect. There is an explanation for it. And it is that, 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 you know, that, that the, the bourgeoisie is not strictly rational. The imperialist bourgeoisies are not strictly rational. They have cults among themselves. And they, you know, the, the, the Hitler was an example, actually. They, they allowed Hitler to do some amazingly rational things from the point of view of German imperialism. Well, now the US is doing some amazingly rational things because it's fixation. It's, it virtually worships the elements of the Zionist movement because partly because of what happened in the 70s, where Friedman and neoliberalism, they think it saved their system. And they regard them as a, as a class conscious reserve, as a vanguard that, uh, that could save their system again in the future. And that's, that's, I think that's what's responsible for this. It is a peculiar thing because you know, strategically, Israel is, Israel is wrecking American power, actually, particularly soft power. Support for Israel is blowing it, blowing it with wide areas of the world and causing, causing the, you know, driving everybody into the hands of the U.S.'s uh, strategic rivals, as it sees it. You know, it really doesn't make sense. And I think, I think there's a sort of mechanical Marxism involved in this. 
you know, like you know, the, the classic an example of that in history is uh, the history of, of, of post-war Marxism is Jerry Healy in the face of the Cuban Revolution, where he basically said, "Well, we can't got a split view that can explain how a, how a, how a, how a communist part, a regime can be created in Cuba." So we'll deny reality. Say Cuba is still capitalist. There hasn't really been a revolution in Cuba, and they con con concoct all sorts of uh, um, what's the word spurious theories to try and justify that. And it made them a laughing stock. And I think it makes a lot of the left the laughing stock when they deny any independent agency of Zionism and any independent power of Zionism in the imperialist countries, because it doesn't really make sense. You know, from the point of view of, of imperialist strategy, some of the things they're doing, and they'll pay for it. They will pay for it. Don't worry, they will. Anyway, I'm just just some food for thought. Anyway, I don't want to lecture people for too long, but I think I do have a different view. Yeah, and I'll hopefully that gives people something to think about. <laughs> Cheers. Sounded like it. Yeah. Does anybody want to reply to <laughs> Ian? Okay, Matthew first. I think. Yep. On. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a few things in there, you know, I mean, you start with the USS Liberty, and if people don't know what the USS Liberty was, it was a CIA listening ship, uh, which the, the Americans sent to basically listen in to the communications of the Israelis as they attacked um, Egypt in particular in the 67 uh, Six Day War. Um, the Israelis uh, attacked the ship, I mean, both from the air and uh, with torpedo boats, uh, and as a result, they killed a large proportion of the crew and, and injured another load, load of people and nearly sank the ship. Um, now, I mean, the thing is, I mean, clearly, you know, serious incident. The crew who still, some of the crew is still still alive, think, think that they've they've been hard done to, which they probably have been, because obviously the Americans then said, well, okay, we shall go and ally ourselves with the Israelis. But the, what are the stakes? I mean, the thing is, obviously, the, the problem is Americans are quite willing to sell their own people, um, you know, especially you know a shipload of, of their own people, in, in, in you know, under conditions in which they can get, they, they want an alliance, you know, which is obviously being extremely significant to them. So, I mean, in those terms, you know, they would be prepared to forgive that kind of transgression. Um, I think it wouldn't happen now. Uh, because they're too into the, 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 the two sides are too integrated. I mean, you know, it's obviously, you know, there wasn't the integration between the the, uh, the two militaries uh, and intelligence services and so on and so forth that there is now. So, in those terms, it's you know, it, 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 it exists as a, an anomaly. Now, in terms of the, I mean, the thing is. The extraordinary thing, of course, is these Russians have no particular beef with the Israelis whatsoever. They have quite good relations with them, actually. They're not, they're not anti-imperialist in that sense. There's actually a deal, there's a floating deal, as people have pointed out, between the, the Russians who actually control Syrian airspace these days and the Israelis. So the Israelis actually have to say to the Russians, look, we're going to conduct an air, air raid in, in Syria. Make sure your guys are nowhere near it. Because um, obviously we don't want to bump into each other in the skies over Syria, um, so they don't, and it and it works. That, that, that's how it's done. You know, the Russians don't want to have a fight with this with the Israelis. You know, and 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 everybody's uh, everybody conducts their business. I mean, the problem. I, I mean, I agree with you. I mean, the, the thing is about about imperialism is is disintegrating. That's the point. I mean, it's disintegrating both in ter world terms and in terms of its own the condition of the U.S. itself. I mean, look at it. You know, it's falling apart. You know, you would expect this. The, 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 the contradictions are bursting out all over the shop. I mean, the thing is, uh, and as I say, internally as well as, as well as externally. So, I mean, obviously, they maintain their their uh, alliance with the um, with the uh, the Israelis, and also, of course, with all the Arab regimes. I mean, the U.S. has never, probably never had better relations with with most of the Arab regimes, which are quite quite lined up. You know, if you look at it, you know, the U.S. has bases across much of the Middle East, which the regimes are quite happy to give them, um, including, as it turns out, of course, the Jordanians, who are deeply embarrassed by the fact that they've they've, they've got secret American bases in there with thousands of troops. Um, including all the Gulf kingdoms who are who have been apparently seen, who were discovered to be secretly supplying the Israelis by road because the Houthis are stopping them doing it by ship. You know these people don't have it. The, the, the actual regimes themselves have no issue with with the Zionists. They don't care. 
you know, who was killing a few, a few hundred, a, a few tens of thousands of people to these characters, you know, like the Saudis or the Gulf Kings or, or, or the Jordanians, they don't give a shit. Um, the, 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 the impact, of course, is on the masses. I mean, you know, this is the problem they've got, of course, is the populations, of course, is, have a quite different view. That they, 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 they see uh, rightly that they, they, their interests lie with the Palestinians. So it actually, you know, puts in, in terms of a struggle against, against the regimes themselves uh, and the imperialists at the same time. The whole thing is stirred up, you know, uh, and, and it has to be looked at, looked at in, those, in those ways. And in terms of, as I say, the disintegration of, 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 of capitalism, of imperialism and of US imperialism itself. Thanks, Matthew. Tony, I think you wanted to say something in terms? Yeah, I mean, you can often argue, as Ian was, that the United States supporting Israel is not in its own interest, but I think it's a really dangerous game for socialists to get into to say what is in imperialism's best interest, because uh, imperialism is the best judge of its own interests, and it may not see things uh, in the same way as we do. Apart from the fact it's incredibly short-termist, this is capitalism generally. It doesn't really look at anything in the long term. That's that's the nature of the beast. But I would think in terms of the regimes which now exist in, in the Arab East, it, America really has got the ideal kind of regimes down the throughout the Gulf and so on, and where it doesn't, like in Iran, it... Uh, makes clear uh, its disapproval. Uh, but the Arab sh Gulf Sheikhdoms and Saudi Arabia and Jordan and Egypt are in its pocket. Uh, uh, I think it is a, as good as it gets. Uh, and as uh, Matthew said, there are vast bases, Qatar, Bahrain and so on, where Britain and America have their bases and they police the region. I mean, the problem is that until there is an Arab revolution which overthrows the rotten order in the Arab East, you will continue to get that. I mean, I think it's ironic. It was South Africa, not any Arab state, that brought the legal case at the International Court of Justice, because that is the legacy of the anti-apartheid struggle. Just as it's ironic that it's the uh, South American regimes, I think, of Belize, and uh, is it Ecuador, which have cut off relations with uh, Israel? It isn't Jordan or Egypt or the Gulf Sheikhdoms that have done that. But Israel historically has uh, acted very decisively against the Arab nationalist re uh, regimes. Uh, it aided Saudi Arabia in the counterinsurgency war it conducted in Yemen uh, in the 50s and 60s. Uh, against the revolutionary groups there. And it, I mean, that's what it was doing when it fought the Houthis in the Yemen more recently. And it's ironic, therefore, it is the only the Houthis who've come, if you like, to the aid of the Palestinians in Gaza. But I really do think there's a problem if we try and say, well, this isn't in America's interest. The fact is that the American bourgeoisie overwhelmingly sees it as in their interests. Uh, and I don't think it's for us to say. Uh, well, it's not in your interest. These are really what your interests are. I don't think socialists should get into that game, to be quite honest. I don't think it would work. You could even say the same thing, actually, of the Iranians. The Iranians don't have re really have a beef with the Israelis either. No, no, I mean, they're, they're, they're not, not they're they're anti imperialists. They're not you know, anti imperialists. If you look at Iran Contra, the regime was quite happy to deal with back channels yeah. to the Israelis. And, and actually, if the if the US offers, offered the Iranians a deal that they could live with, they would happily take it tomorrow. Yes, absolutely. And on anti-Semitism, I mean, I think it's worth pointing out because people continually forget it. The most anti-Semitic movements and groups and parties in the world are the ones that give Israel the most support, whether it's Viktor Orban in Hungary or indeed the uh, AFD in Germany, which is riding it 20% plus in the polls, it's overridden with the uh, neo-Nazis, Holocaust deniers and other detritus. Uh, and yet, when it comes to Israel, it's the most pro-Zionist party. It would make BDS illegal at a stroke. And the same in America. Trump, he, I mean, he's anti-Semitic, but he, he loves Israel. Uh, I mean, th that's where the anti-Semitism uh, comes from. It's from Israel's own supporters. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Roger, did you want to say anything on that? Or shall we? I don't really have anything more to add. Okay. I think it's we've, been a very good discussion. Yeah, we've got some more comrades who want to ask questions or have comments. Um, Cheryl, please. 
Hi, yeah. I mean, some of the um, points that I was going to raise have already been raised, but I'm wondering whether or not America is beginning uh, to feel afraid it will no longer be the world superpower, especially with the BRICS countries and their aim to um, for de-dollarisation. De and um, so whether or not that they have so fiercely supported this war is in relation to their fear of losing their own power as, as the world's, uh, you know, superpower. And um, I suppose the other thing I wanted to raise was about, you know, the resources in the area, the gas fields, which are in, I think, the north of Israel. There's gas fields off the coast of Gaza. So there's lots of reasons, I would imagine, why America wants to keep grip of um uh, supporting Israel. The other thing that I wanted to say is in relation to the axis of resistance, which is the Hezbollah in uh, Lebanon and the Houthis. And recently there's been attacks on US, the US soldiers by the um, Iraqi militants um, in it seems like the whole area is, I mean, it's all really boils down to oil and who's con in control of resources because it wasn't until I went on some quite a few um, educational webinars with colleagues, comrades from the Middle East, that you realise how complicated, like, the whole picture is of, you know, the Kurds being aligned to the Americans because of oil and because there's been so many attacks and counterattacks in that region recently it's really difficult to make sense of who's doing what to who and why but um evidently the root of it all is about who controls who controls the oil who controls power um which is why the um you know the saudis grip on the parts of yemen they still have grip a grip on the um Saudi still controls the most wealthiest resource um, area, oil rich area in Yemen. And the other thing I just wanted to mention is uh, to do with Saudi, that they have recently made a statement that they will not, um, they will not agree to normalization unless there is a Palestinian state. And Hamas have recently said that they want the guarantors of their um, agreement to be um, Russia, U uh, United Nations, Turkey, um, Qatar. So all, I suppose what I'm saying, probably in quite a muddled way, is that the whole sort of dynamics of who controls what and oil are so complicated that to just see it through the prism of America and Israel is just like a bit tunnel vision because it's the whole wider geopolitics, not just only of the, re of the region, but like the whole of the world. Um, yeah, that's what I wanted to say. Thanks. Thank you, Cheryl. Uh, anybody wants to reply to that? Does it boil down to oil? I mean, uh, you know, I say briefly, I think there's a few, I mean, obviously the, the, the problem with it for the people using the dollar, of course, actually, um, you know, obviously, you know, given, I think there's two factors in that one, obviously, is the decline of the US itself. And the other one that's actually caused a major eruption has, of course, been the sanctions on Russia, because what the Americans have done is to seize dollar assets. Um, uh, and, and what that says is, well, OK, um, your money ain't your money um, if it's in dollars, because if it's in dollars, we'll have it off you if we don't like the look of you. And that really does raise issues for all sorts of people. You know, so that really, you know, uh, opens that, you know, a big can of worms in those terms. Um, so in terms of the, um, the Saudi deal, 
I mean, the thing is, the Saudis were quite, were quite happy to have a deal with, his, with the Israelis. It's actually one of the prompts for the breakout on October the 7th was the fact the Saudis were about to sign a deal with the Israelis. And of course, what, what it did was to destroy that, that that's going to happen. Um, and, but the problem they've got, of course, is that it now, of course, is that the, the, the populations of Arab, of Arab countries are, 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 are you know, incredibly um, anti-Israeli. I mean, you know, the, the problem you can go right across the region, you know, everywhere. Um, you know, the, the regimes, of course, are not. They don't give a shit. But the, it really creates an issue for them, you know. The the the, the you know where you've got Jordan, where they're trying to burn the Isra the U.S. the Israeli embassy and the U.S. embassy, you know? <laughs> and you can go through all the countries and everybody's you know really really hostile. I mean, uh, 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 to a tremendous degree, and, and businesses now are being driven out of the Middle East. You know, a whole series of businesses, multinational businesses, because people just won't buy anything off them anymore. Because the whole population basically we're not dealing with these people because you're obviously in the bed with the Zionists. So it, 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 in those terms, it's moving things politically and socially quite a lot. Um, so yeah, I'll leave it there. Thanks. Tony or Roger, did you want to say anything? Not at this stage, sure. I could come back later. Okay, okay. How about you, Tony? Uh, I mean I mean Cheryl's right, it's not just about oil. I mean it's that's very clear from the Houthis attack that uh, the Suez Canal is a vital artery for all sorts of trade because it's much easier and cheaper and quicker to go through the Suez Canal and therefore along the Red Sea than it is to go around the Cape of Good Hope. Uh, but also it's in terms of, if you like, overall dominance, full spectrum dominance in the sense of the United States in terms of its military uh, posture, because the United States under Biden was not particularly interested in the Middle East until uh, all of this blew up here. He put it on a back burner. He, he wasn't really interested in his presidency in that. He was more interested in the pivot to China via the AUKUS pact. I mean, because China is the second major, well, in fact, the major competitor against the United States economically and to a, a greater extent militarily. And we've also seen that Ukraine has dropped off the agenda. And there, there may be real differences between Biden and Trump uh, in terms of uh, how the approach is to the Ukraine, because Ukraine is absorbing vast amounts of uh, weapons and dollars, etc. And because it's so corrupt, it's not really having a great effect on the field uh, as much as anything else. So there may be a change in the attitude to Ukraine if Trump wins uh, in the November elections, because Biden, uh, I, I would find it very difficult to think that he can win the presidential election now. He's lost his base. People really don't want to vote for Butcher Biden anymore. So uh, we, we shall see. But Israel, I mean, it will be crucial, uh, without a doubt, because it's a stable settler base. Uh, and it, it has these links with Arab regimes, which can only exist through repression because, as Matthew said, they're incredibly unpopular. We saw that at the World Cup uh, when, you know, people were openly hostile to any Israeli presence there, much to their own surprise. They believed that Arab regimes being friendly to Israel therefore meant the people. And they, they got quite a shock that that wasn't the case, that Israel is hated everywhere for what it does. So. Uh, yes, it's an incredibly unstable situation in the Middle East. And I'd further go along with the uh, suggest that although Israel is quite determined, despite what it says, to ethnically cleanse Gaza of the vast majority of its population, it may not get away with that because that will be one step too far. I may be wrong on that, but uh, that's, I would hazard, hazard a guess on that. But the amounts of people who are dying at the moment is horrific. And what Israel is doing is that, I mean, people will die more from disease and famine than they will actually from the bombs itself. So it is it is really a genocide and a holocaust in the making uh, as we speak. And that, that should be our main priority, really. So, Tony, who do you think will would, would stop Israel getting away with it then? Uh, well, it's a, it's a good question. I, I think the United States may be forced to pull the plug in the end uh, because it's becoming too overt. It, it is quite interesting that multiple countries are now going to the ICJ and the 
uh, uh, and the International Criminal Court saying, well, look, you have this international human rights architecture and international law. What are you doing about it? Is it completely bankrupt? So it is throwing up a problem and some countries like Belgium, for example, and Spain have not gone along with the cutting the aid to UNRWA because, of course, what was the United States response to the International Court judgment? To cut off food for the Palestinians. I mean, could you think of anything more genocidal than that? But some countries have not got along with that. And Israel bombed uh, Belgium's main uh, presence in Gaza City. It completely took out the building, you know, so to say, uh, just to demonstrate their contempt for anyone who doesn't back them 100%. So that may start to cause eruptions even within the EU, which has been wholeheartedly in support of Israel, led by Germany, of course. Of course. Uh, Tony, can I could I just ask Tony a really quick question? I know it's a little tiny bit off Go point. on, make it quick. Mm -hmm. Um, Iran. Why does Iran want the you know this axis of resistance? What is Iran's interest in it's that? Got... Been a real major player in terms of the resistance as in Palestine at the moment, in terms of support for Hamas, Hezbollah. Well, Iran. Mm. It hasn't chosen the role that it's been assigned. It would have preferred to come to terms with imperialism, and it thought it had done with Obama. But of course, Trump overthrew everything, and Biden hasn't been prepared to reinstate what went before. Iran has interests. It is also it, it has interests in, uh, if you like, being a regional player. Uh, I won't say a hegemon, but certainly it has interests. And Israel wants to be the dom uh, the complete dominating uh, regime and power in the Middle East. So that is what's the cause of this. It wasn't about nuclear power. That was always a red herring uh, because the, the agreement that Bo Obama had reached would have stopped it progressing to a nuclear weapon. It was about the role of Iran in the Middle East, which is why Israel said it must be linked to the question of terrorism, which is another way of saying you don't support these uh, different groups and movements, etc. So Iran has been forced to give support to the Houthis and to Hamas and others. Uh, and you see that in Iraq today, where I mean, various militias are now confronting the United States. And that is what could blow the situation up if the United States gets drawn into a general war, which it fears and other people fear as well. But... I wouldn't hazard a guess as to what will be the eventual outcome. Ian, please. Uh, good evening, comrades. Um, excellent discussion. I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, I just wanted to make a couple of little points, really. First is about conspiracy theories. Um, there is a ruling class. It really rules, and it does conspire. Uh, but to, to explain what is happening in the Middle East, or to explain US support for Israel uh, on the basis of conspiracy theories is, I think, false. Um, imperialism is the explanation, really. And also, you know, I would argue that the, the US, if it was in its interest to drop Israel like a hot potato, would drop Israel like a hot potato. Um, South Africa, uh, if people remember, I mean, Growing up in, in London and because of South Africa House being there, most of the, my active political life uh, when I was younger, nobody gave a toss really about South Africa apart from people who were genuinely on the left. And South Africa seemed to be almost invincible. Um, but of course, once the Soviet Union had collapsed, once the money had gone from Consul Wiseswick, once the uh, South, South African Communist Party decided South Africa should be a, a safe place to make profits in, um, then apartheid was dispensable. And I think Israel would be dispensable under certain circumstances. There was an accusation of a kind of mechanical Marxism being waged here, as it were. Um, of course, why, you know, this series has been going on for a little while, and I think if one looks at it in the round, uh, I, I think that's completely false. I mean, Yasser bin Matha, in talking about um, uh, Arab nationalism, what we might today think of as the kind of progressive Arab nationalism in the period uh, of the 40s, 50s and early 60s, is an interesting point, isn't it? Because after all, um, 
if it was in the US interest to be friendly with Arab nations, uh, as in course it is indeed already. Um, but if but if you look at what was going on in, in the Arab world, uh, in Iraq, in Syria, in Egypt, <clears throat> with a kind of obstinate insistence that the resources of those countries that actually enrich those countries rather than be appropriated by the United States or whatever, then of course you, you have a, a, a completely different dynamic. And that's the point. This is a, <clears throat> a dynamic situation and far from being mechanical. Um, on the question of rationality, whether it's rational to support Israel or rational to support whoever, um, generally speaking, the ruling class, as I say, does rule and it does and they do talk to one another and they are a, a far more cohesive class arguably than the proletariat at the moment <clears throat> but they will do things which on the face of it might seem irrational so let's take for example the bourgeoisie support for hitler bourgeoisie doesn't like fascism it's bad for business uh, and uh, but in the context of a germany which could potentially have had a revolution which could have been the spark for a world revolution then to have the SR prepared to go around and beat up communists is a, a, a very rational idea from a from a bourgeois point of view. Um, <clears throat> had had Germany not potentially been the fulcrum for world revolution, then um, nobody would have given Hitler a, a, a second look. Um, the, however, of course, things can sometimes get out of control, as Harold Macmillan, that great theorist uh, of the left <laughs> was want to say events dear boy events um and and, and things do get out of control. and and same with the the king david hotel for example i mean um the little loyal jewish ulster uh, turned around and uh, and decided it was wanted to be independent uh, so uh, at, attacking the king david hotel was just a way of getting the brits out a bit sooner uh, and it's an interesting dynamic as well because by getting the Brits out a bit sooner, they could carry out um, the ethnic cleansing that fully intended to. Um, in a way, Britain, in its perfidious Albion state, uh, was facing both ways. On the one hand, it was perfectly happy to have Israel as a as a as a as a, as a client state, but on the other hand, um, in principle, had to uh, defend the, the Arab population. Uh, but of course it didn't and actually aided um, in, in many cases, or at least turned turned a blind eye to the atrocities being committed by the Urgun and Haganah and Lehi and so on. So um, it, it is far from being mechanical. It, it, you can see the dynamism in, in all of it. I just wanted to say a couple of little things maybe. I mean, I'm interested about Egypt, you know, the, the logical thing, and, and, and I've heard con some kind of conspiratorial ideas that somehow um, if Egypt could just be prevailed to take all those people from Gaza, because after all, Gaza was part of Egypt at one time, um, they could just be relocated and some of the funding from the gas fields could, could go to just building a new Bantustan somewhere in um, the Sinai Desert. Um, <sighs> The problem is uh, for Egypt that you've got a huge population of people who won't forget that and who won't forget that betrayal and uh, and the, the fear of losing Egypt as a loyal client state of U.S. imperialism is is also part of the dynamic. Um, so I think that's really the only other thing I wanted to add was about this kind of genetic stuff. I mean. Reading Shlomo Sand's books was really quite fascinating from my point of view. Um, but I don't think it really matters whether the Ashkenazim were descended from the Khazars or whatever else. It bears no relation on the current state of what's going on. But what Shlomo Sand did effectively and what his powerful contribution really was just to kind of debunk the whole uh, foundation myths of, of, of Zionism. And, and from that... From that point of view, I'm delighted to see it. I don't, I don't think any of the kind of silly nonsense about genetic testing of Central European Jews or anybody else is going to make the slightest difference one way or the other. Thank you. Thanks, Ian. Who would like to reply? Or shall we have another? Yeah, thanks, yeah. Okay. Um, Steve, then. Thanks, Ian. 
Okay, thank you, um, comrades. Obviously, the, it was been very interesting and the, all uh, different angles on it. And also, you've got to remember that the two speakers were asked to talk mainly about America, the relationship between America and Israel. Obviously, comrade, in the discussion, we've widened it out a little bit beyond that. And that's not a criticism because that was the brief, as it were, the speakers were given to concentrate on that. And in effect, missing out some of the, the wider issues by concentrating, but that's not a problem. But I think I've got three points I, I would like to um, raise. The first one is about um, 1945. And obviously the Zionists at that time were anti-British. They were not anti-imperialist. They just wanted to get rid of Britain because that was their project to establish a Zionist state. But they couldn't have achieved that, by the way, by by their tactics, unless the balance of forces after the Second World War uh, changed everything. Uh, just in the same way that America wouldn't allow Britain to carry re re take control of Suez, the Americans and the Soviet Union, especially those two powers, were not going to allow Britain to keep its colonies. So you've got to see Britain's retreat from. Palestine in the same way their retreat from India, Burma, Burma, Egypt, and their problems in Iran, all these other places. This is a part of the retreat of British. So in a way, the Zionists were pushing at an open door because Britain was being forced by wider circumstances um, to, to retreat. And it's that bigger picture, uh, I think, that's, that's, that's uh, significant. Um, second thing, I mean, the other thing about 1945 was America was making a new deal with Saudi Arabia. And I still think Saudi Arabia has got, a, 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 Cheryl mentioned this as well and other comrades, but Saudi Arabia, I think, is really important in this whole story. It's clear, or it seems to me anyway, that Blinken is trying to get Saudi Arabia in line for a two-state solution or some, some version of a two-state solution. Uh, because uh, Saudi Arabia is a major ally, they, 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 the, the Abraham Accord shows that they were trying to get Israel and Saudi Arabia into the same uh, group against Iran. And they were nearly going to achieve that until, as, as some uh, comrades said previously, until October the 7th blew that up. Now, Saudi Arabia can't get back into that position now unless something is done about two states. And that's what Blinken is concerned about. And as comrades have said, uh, they, 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 I've seen articles that mention Ramadan. They're very, very concerned that when in, in, I'm not quite sure when Ramadan is, but it's in a month or two's time. They've got to do, they're hoping to do a deal before them because they're very concerned that as people come out onto the streets and at the time of Ramadan, there will be trouble brewing, even in, in places like Saudi Arabia. So I think that, the situation is is very difficult for the Americans trying to span all of these uh, balancing points. Uh, my last point was just an observation. I don't know whether Tony knows this one. He possibly does. But there was a treaty signed, I saw, um, between um, the UK and Saudi Arabia. No, it's UK and Israel. Sorry. It's called the Roadmap for... 2030. Have you come across that, Tony? I don't know if you have, but anyway, there's a trade deal, there's an education deal, there's a cultural deal. As I looked at this deal, apparently Israel supplies one in seven of one in seven of all our medicines are supplied by Israel. But in this deal that was signed, uh, it's included in this deal combating uh, delegitimization. De 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 Both countries are committed. It says here. Uh, to fighting all forms of anti-Semitism, including in its modern form, the delegitimization of the state of Israel, as elaborated in the um, IHR definition. So it's actually written into a trade deal that the, the two countries are in. It says down here, the UK reaffirms its objection to boycotts, divestment and sanctions campaigns. Such campaigns are at variance with the UK's government policy. And not only unfairly single out Israel, undermine efforts to advance Israeli-Palestinian dialogue and reconciliation, but contribute to the deplorable rise of anti-Semitism in the UK. The UK is committed to 
ending any such campaigns by public bodies. So this is in a trade deal signed by the Crown, by the by the UK and Israel in March this year. I think March last year, March 2023. It's worth looking it up because it's got a lot of interesting things in it. Thank you very much, Steve. OK, that was our last contribution from the floor. Um, I mean, the, the, I have to say that the debate uh, on camera is a lot healthier than what's going on in the chat, I'm afraid to say. <laughs> so uh, there's a lot of uh, conspiracy stuff in, in the chat, and um, uh, there must be probably a good reason why these uh, comrades are not coming on the on the camera to say those things. But if, if any of you want to reply to some of those things or just have a little uh, summation of our session tonight, we will be looking at the question of the solution to the, 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 the situation in the Middle East in the next week's sessions with Gada Kami, one state, two states or something entirely different. So we can, you know, let's not focus on that now, but let's let's focus on the, 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 the question we've been discussing tonight. Um, I suggest Roger, Matthew, Tony. In that order? Hi. Okay, I'm only going to make a few very general points. I think it, it's been a very wide-ranging discussion, a very interesting discussion, uh, and I've learned something from it. Um, I just want to make what I think is the basic point. When we're talking about um, who is, is the tail wagging the dog or vice versa, the question is, let's just think, what it, it may seem extraordinary at first sight, that the US, the USA is uh, supporting the, um, and without question, and supporting and arming and financing and giving uh, absolute uh, full backing to this genocide in, in uh, Gaza and generally to the, uh, to the monstrous policies of uh, the Israeli regime. But let's look at it this way. What would happen if if uh, the USA withdrew support, they would the whole cauldron would explode. The whole area is bubbling with ethnic conflicts. Of course, the um, the Palestinian issue overwhelmingly dwarfs all the others. But let's remember, we had um, in any case we've had uh, apart from the Palestinian issue, we had in the past we we've, we've got sectarian conflicts and communal conflicts. Uh, which have been raging throughout the area um, ever since the the um, uh, you know, ever since the Second World War. Really, we've had the Lebanon civil war. We've had massacres in Jordan. We've had now the sectarian um, uh, sectarian divisions in um, in Iraq. We've had the whole question of the Kurdish national oppression in several countries. We've got um, the whole region is just simmering. And uh, uh, and it would explode with any with any um, change to the balance of forces, and that's why uh, the U.S. imperialism is in hock. We, we otherwise the idea of the, the some kind of the, oh the Zionist oligarchy. Well, I mean that is all a factor. Of course, they, the, there are uh, lobbies and there are there are interests and there are pressures and pressure groups or rest of it. But the point is, imperialism decides when the when in as it assesses the interests of the um, of uh, imperialism and of um, of capitalism and of its rule, and um, if the um, if Israel uh, if if um, U.S. withdrew support from Israel, there would be an absolute uh, explosion and um, uh, a complete uh, complete mayhem from their point of view. Therefore, what position do we need to take? Let's remember the reason all of this is. Um, is really it's the unresolved un, uh, issues that arose out of the um, end of the first world war. Never mind the second, the the uh, the division of the area by the by the French and the British, the Sykes Picot plan, which simply drew uh, arbitrary straight lines on the map, and it ended up leaving all these uh, multiple communal uh, issues raging throughout the throughout the whole area. So what should our position be on that? We, we, there's all this um, constant um, arguments about whether we want a one-state solution or a two-state solution or what. The point is that actually neither of those um, uh, poses any uh, viable solution, uh, uh, which uh, could only end, um, if, it's, if it's left on those terms, it could only end 
with um, Israeli domination and another form of the slavery of the Palestinian um, people. But what we have to say is, as socialists, that the whole region, the whole map has to be redrawn. We have to say that we, we are in favor of a socialist federation of the Middle East, which could uh, which could actually find a, uh, which would be the only means of finding the beginning of a solution to all the national and communal and sectarian problems that are bubbling in the whole, uh, the whole region. I think I'll leave it at that. Uh, thanks, comrades. Thank you, Roger. Uh, Matthew. Yeah, I think I think obviously, I mean, it, it, it's quite clear, you know, that, that the Israelis are dependent on the US, and that they're, you know, that, that, that okay, you know, clearly you see the interlinking of the two, and the fact, as I say, that, that it's now quite clear that, that the Biden administration actually supplied military, um, you know, staff to plan the assault on Gaza, to assist in planning on the assault on Gaza. It's that close to inter. You, know, you could, I mean, you know, if you stand the Israelis up in court and say, you know, you're guilty, that's so by the administration, absolutely, yeah, there with it. So that, that, hence why they were so agitated. But the core of this really is is mass resistance. I mean, the problem they've got is you've got tens and hundreds of millions of people who are saying they reject this this barbarism and, and butchery of, of uh, on, uh, uh, you know, on, on you know, it, people's phones and, and computer screens. I mean, despite the, the, the rotten propagandists and their effort to stifle the thing, I mean, people can watch this war in re live in real time because there are people of genuine courage who will put it up there on, on, on social media. Um, and so it, it's, it's, you know, in that way, it's, it's changing things. And you see, I mean, you know, really, I mean, the core, I mean, the, 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 the real core of it then is look, you look at the, the impact in the Arab countries, particularly obviously Egypt as the largest uh, country. Uh, and, and, you know, the, 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 if you like, the real sort of central gravity of the region. Um, uh, you know, Al, uh, I mean, the notion that Al-Sisi could, uh, could, could accept, you know, that he would, he would form the other half of a, of, of a deal with the Israelis to, to, to clean, ethnically clean Gaza, it's unbelievable. He couldn't, there's, no, there's just no way he could survive. You know, the, the, the explosion would be something else. I mean, they, they allowed, because of mass pressure in Egypt, they allowed you know people to demonstrate, and the first place they went for you know, in Cairo was Tahrir Square, despite the fact, of course, they were banned from going near the place. They managed to break through the lines. I mean, you know, okay, obviously at a great cost of people who did, but I mean, it's, it's you know, it's exactly people understand exa exactly this, you know, and and the slogans raised were not merely about Palestine; they were also the slogans of of, of, of twenty eleven. When they destroyed Mubarak's regime, you know, I mean, they, you know, they understand that people understand that this is these, these are the stakes, you know, um, and I mean, you know, you look at it. I mean, the, the Egyptian masses destroyed the Egyptian police force in one day. One day, the problem was it didn't have political leadership, you know. Um, anyway, so I mean, in in those terms, and you can see, I mean, even sort of countries like Kuwait, I mean, there's a there's various people in Glasgow from 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 these countries, and they actually show you things like in Kuwait, you know, an actual advertising poster, you know, an official one that says, "Have you killed a Palestinian today?" I.e., have you bought any of this stuff that's on the BDS list, you bastards? <laughs> you know, and and that's the feeling, you know, you don't, you know, simply these there's just in mass mass rejection. And it, you know, again, I mean, as I say, the, the, it's destabilizing the whole the whole area in those terms. And you can see that actually the, the, in the ICJ. Um, I mean, the ICJ, the, the, you know, they always tell us your courts are not political, which of course is complete and utter bullshit. Um, that that the ICJ actually the, the the whole business of that of that initial ruling was completely political. It's completely the balance. I mean, you can see it. You know, the fact that I mean, everybody, everybody can see this is a genocide. You know, I mean, any idiot looking at it for five minutes says this is a genocide, um, and therefore they were forced to to, to find at least in some in some, to some degree it is, you know, that it was a genocide. And but they were obviously under pressure from the imperialist powers the other way, saying, well, you can't so well, you can't order a stop. They wouldn't order a stop. So you could see exactly the political balance just in that one in that one judgment, you know, or in that one that one statement. Um, it's it, it's extraordinary. And, it, and 
you know, it will change. It will change everything. This, you know, in those terms, um, and really, it's it, it, it is, you know, whether or not the 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 the, the, the imperialists and, and so on can survive, and and it's not and it's not just in terms of what's happening in the Middle East. It's also what's happening in the U.S. itself. The fact you've got a revolt in the U.S. You've got thousands of people on the street, despite the repression, the efforts to say people being sacked. You know, McCarthyism, which are on a much worse scale than we've got here. You know, um, people being being persecuted, uh, removed from their jobs, um, told that they won't get jobs, uh, but people still come out. And the thing, the great thing about it, of course, is it's led by the by Jewish youth. This thing is led by Jewish youth, but then labelled as anti-Semites, which is extraordinary. You know, I mean, it just shows you how degenerate the whole bloody process is. And the final thing I would say is that. The other thing, of course, is that the one thing that, that really goes against the whole lot is the judgment on David Miller, which says that in, in the face of everything which has been said about the IRHA and so on, that anti-Zionism, it does exist, it is political, and, you, you, you know, it has to be recognised under, uh, 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 under the 2000 Act as, as a protected uh, belief. Which is quite extraordinary in those terms. I mean, I think you know, obviously you don't you don't set store by by by, by these things, but it's an extraordinary judgment. Thanks. Absolutely. Uh, thank you for bringing that up. That is, it was a very important uh, judgment, and also shows whenever these accusations of anti-Semitism, you know, most of them are obvious claptrap. We know it. We know there's been a, an attempt, a sex, successful attempt, to redefine what anti-Semitism is. But it comes in front, even in front of a bourgeois court without, you know, with all the limitation that comes up. We have no, you know, we have no uh, hope that justice is delivered in a bourgeois court. But it comes to a bourgeois court and it's laughed out of court. Employment tribunals where this is being called. You know, Stan Keeble as well had to have his job back, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's laughable, but that's, you know, they got away with it. They have been successful uh in in their own terms but um you know we're we're fighting back and it's a really important uh, judgment thanks for bringing that up tony yes indeed uh i think the first thing to say about the palestinian struggle is that it's symbolic throughout the arab region for the domination of that region by imperialism and what does that mean in practice it means that the vast wealth of Saudi Arabia, Kuwait and the others goes not into benefiting the people of those regions, but into benefiting imperialism itself through the petrodollars and also, of course, the corrupt Saudi monarchy above all uh, and its waste of literally billions and billions uh, of dollars. I mean, there is a very real, if you like, impoverishment of the region. And one of the reasons, one of the effects certainly of the, the war in Iraq was that, if you like, the health service and the very modern facilities that the Ba'athist regime, for all its crimes, uh, did, it actually had a, a fairly, if you like, progressive health system and social security system. And all of that has gone, by the way, with the American occupation and the complete corruption for Blackwater and all the other US multinationals who've pillaged that uh, country. So the Palestinians are really important to the Palestinian struggle because it symbolizes everything about imperialism's domination in the region. The other thing we should look at is Israel itself, because in the last year, I think it was in January when the elections were, the settler right, the far right, messianic fundamentalist Jewish settlers came to power in Israel, represented by Smotrich and Ben Gavir. Uh, and they are really a neo-Nazi, Judeo-Nazi right, for whom, you know, no amount of Palestinian deaths was enough. I mean, they are genocidalists. And you would have thought that uh, the American and British press would have picked up on these characters who are now running Israel. I mean, the spiritual mentor of Ben Gavir, Itamar Ben Gavir, is a police and security minister. He's not, he's not a minor figure. It is a Rabbi Dov Lior, chief of the West Bank rabbis, who is on record as saying that one Jewish fingernail is more valuable than a thousand non Jewish lives. Uh, and his hero is Baruch uh, Goldstein, who, who committed a massacre in Hebron's uh, Ibrahimi Mosque. 
And when Yaakov Perrin, another rabbi, gave uh, the funeral oration, he upped it from 1,000 to 1 million non-Jewish lives were, were worth less than the Jewish fingernail. So he, this gives you some idea of the kind of people in Israel. And yet the West has glossed over who it is who's driving the war in Israel. Uh, and we should be able to attribute this to, to really the, uh, the propaganda press that we see, whether it's the BBC, which didn't cover the opening speech in the South African case, but managed to get in Israel's reply in, in, in real time. I mean, their bias is just overwhelming. Uh, so the, the very real divisions in Israel, in essence, between those who want a theocratic state and those who want some kind of secular racist state, uh, which is what the demonstrations were really about, uh, have come to the fore. Now, people, if you like, get hung up about Zionist oligarchs and Zionist lobbies and so on. Let me say this, certainly these lobbies are nasty, pernicious, malevolent, and should be fought whenever they re raise their ugly head. Whether it's UK Lawyers for Israel, the Campaign Against Anti-Semitism, the Anti-Defamation League, and so on. They are nasty, you know, reactionary, semi-fascist, etc. But we should never forget the question, where do they get their power from? What gives them the, the ability to conduct the campaigns they do? And they are given that power, and they're given that power by our own ruling class. The campaign against anti-Semitism would be nothing if they didn't have access to the hallways of the Home Office and Sue Braverman, as she was then, and probably the current Home Secretary as well. So that's what I say. It, to look at it simply as Zionist oligarchs is looking down the telescope through the wrong end. You're getting the wrong picture. They don't get their power independently or autonomously or because even they're Jewish. It's because they, they have access to power because they operate in the interests of power, the power of imperialism. But And we should not forget, I mean, when they go on about anti-Semitism, anti-Semitism is a very simple thing. You know, I mean, my dad fought in the, uh, the Battle of Cable Street. You know, he was a Zionist, but he, most Zionists were uh, opposed to anti-Semitism. He wasn't in the leadership. He didn't need a definition of anti-Semitism to know what it was he was fighting. Anti-Semitism is a very clear and obvious thing. It's someone who doesn't like or hates Jews, ask Jews. That, that's really all it is. It's hostility to Jews as Jews. You can look it up in the Oxford English Dictionary. It's about eight words. You don't need a 500 word definition in order to understand what anti-Semitism. What these people have done, of course, is twist anti-Semitism into a definition which will support our ruling classes. So it's no, no accident that some of the most anti-Semitic people in the world are those who now support or oppose anti-Semitism. The Tommy Robinsons, the Richard Spencers, the Donald Trumps, the Steve Bannons and all the rest of it. Anti-Semitism has been weaponized by anti-Semites to use against people who are anti-racist. So it's no wonder at all today that the demonstrations, I mean, not only uh, in, in the United States, but even in Britain, uh, are now increasingly led by anti-Zionist Jewish youth. Jews against genocide in this country, the Jewish bloc on the demonstrations, etc., and they are pilloried as anti-Semitic. It's it, it's beyond parody in a sense. So uh, we should junk all of this, uh, and we should certainly oppose any attempt to infiltrate the IHRA into schools, which is what the Department of Education is currently doing. So I, I give that warning, uh, and I'll end on that note. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you very much, comrades. Roger, Matthew and, and Tony, brilliant contributions. Thank you for comrades of the audience who've participated. And we hope to see you all next week when we're talking with Gada Kami about, you know, one state solution, two state solutions or something entirely different. We're also adding one more session at the end on the drive to World War Three conscriptions, mental health issues of soldiers, etc. That'd be a very interesting discussion for sure, I'm, I'm, I'm convinced. Thank you very much, comrades, for joining, and we'll see you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.